C today on behalf of on behalf of myself and Celine Carfont, um, we'll be hosting this standard vocabularies and ontologies workshop today. Um, just as kind of a, a side um, kind of uh, ask for people, you know, thank you coming for coming so much. If you want to keep up with our general kind of workflow and what we've been doing, uh, we can be. Uh, you can join us on Slack, join our mailing list please take a look at our website or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And this is where we will update with different workshops we're doing, updates to our certain, our um, our, our work that we've been going through um, and these sorts of things. Um, for this session, as others, we have live translations in both Spanish and Chinese. If I'm going too fast, someone please raise my hand, raise their hand. Uh, there's a button located on the bottom bar if you wish to benefit of this translation option. Now, quick code of conduct. Uh, we encourage uh, you to show empathy and kindness towards others. Be respectful of different opinions, viewpoints, experiences technological choices. Um, we are looking for and accepting constructive feedback. So please, um, please do tell us what you think of, of what we're doing here. Um, and also take responsibility for mistakes and any impact on others and learn from this experience. Uh, taking breaks is very important um, as well. Uh, we have kind of a no harassment policy on in these sessions, verbal and text communications, uh, that reinforce social structures of domination related to gender, gender identity, expression, et cetera, et cetera. These are unwelcome here. If you're feeling uncomfortable, please give us an email um, or to me or uh, Emma. Now, just kind of a background on who we are. We are the International Committee on Open Fidelist Science, also known as ICOPS. Uh, we have 12 members of the committee and we are from around the world. We regularly work to have discussions and work together in a way to try to open Phytolith science. Our goal is to increase the knowledge and implementation of op op open science practices in Phytolith research. And we have several initiatives at the moment. Uh, Emma and Celine are part of the, uh, the FAIR Phytolith project, which is looking on how the FAIR data principles could be implemented in Phytolith research. We've also started working on this Phytolith ontology, which we will talk about today. And third, we are doing these program of training workshops. Uh, we've also built a multilingual website in the last year, and you can read more about our work on this website. Uh, the link is in the shared document, and I don't know if anyone has shared the document yet in the chat. Thanks. Um, our main objective today is kind of to talk about explain the use of standard vocabularies and particularly ontologies and how we're using it for interoperability of different data sets. And um, we hope to make this very clear as we go along in this presentation. And so first off, I will introduce our first speaker, Henriette Harmsay will be our first speaker. She is a project leader for ontology tools in samples, phenotypes, and ontologies team of the European Bioinformatics Institute, EMBLEBI. And she will introduce us to a standard vocabularies, ontologies, and it will be structured um, first as a description of the problem, then key features of ontologies and vocabularies, how are standard vocabularies and ontologies used, and how they can be useful, how can we use reasoning, and how can we choose to build our own ontology or use existing ontologies? Following this, uh, Frances Wong will present the Image Data Resource Project. She is the scientific curator for the IDR, and she will show us how to use image data resources and how it works with other types of ontologies. Third, we will have Luke uh, Vrijas, uh, um, who is a phytolith researcher and a member of the International Committee on Phytolith Taxonomy. Uh, he will present the standardized nomenclature of phytoliths. Uh, many of us have been using this for quite a few years now, the ICPN 2.0, and how to use it correctly. And then finally, me and Celine will be presenting on kind of our very, very, very early stages of phytolith ontologies um, and how we're trying to use this to implement better interoperability uh, of phytolith data sets between researchers, between schools of phytolith uh, research as well. 
And of course, at the end, we would love to hear your views and comments. So without any kind of further ado, please let me open the floor. I will stop sharing and allow Henriette to go. Sorry, I needed to first unmute myself because I couldn't get hold of the mute button when I shared my screen. Okay, so I'll, the first issue that you have before I even start to tell you about ontologies is that there's two data related problems when you try to integrate data that you typically will experience and which um, ontologies can help resolve. So the first problem is that you have a situation where different words may be used to refer to the same concept. Here on the left-hand side, I have a, um, all the different ways in which we found at EBI that people used to refer to female. And um, that is a single concept that they're trying to refer to and that's all the words they used. Then on the right-hand side, sometimes even when we use the same word, we may end up um, referring to different concepts. So in the case of a fly, if I refer to tibia, the tibia of a fly is different to the tibia of a human. And it's different to this sort of snail thingy that is also referred to as tibia. So these things are things that you would like to be able to, to distinguish. So um, then moving on now to ontologies and vocabularies, I'll highlight the key features that makes it possible to, um, the, or that, that's the characteristics of ontologies and vocabularies. And the very first thing is that you have these globally unique identifiers. So in this case, we look at, uh, we're looking at a concept called liver disease. And um, here in red, you have the global unique identifier. And you can see this is HTTP W um, dot EBI dot AC dot UK slash EFO EFO underscore triple zero one four two one. So instead of in your data referring to liver disease, what you do is you actually refer to this um, uh, globally unique identifier and that makes it um, unambiguous as to what you're referring to. But then, then what you also have is besides this globally unique identifier, ontologies are defined in a standard format. And because of this standard machine readable syntax, you are able to extract certain human readable information from this on the ontologies. So liver disease is the label, so you can extract that. Um, then I have the, that um, if we look at the second uh, red box, it says a disease involving the liver. So you have your definition and we can extract that from the ontology. And then what is also quite useful is knowing what are the synonyms for this concept. So, well, liver disease is what we refer to, but often people may refer to it as, let's say, disease of liver. And when you build systems, instead of just searching for liver disease, what you can do is cater also for these synonyms. So you're searching for those as well. Um, then what you also have is the classification. So as you have in a taxonomy, you typically want to classify from the most general to the most specific. And that is something that you can do with ontologies as well. So if I look here, you start with something like a disease and it gets more um, uh, specific to digestive system disease, then liver disease, and um, eventually at the lowest level for this concept was something like al alcoholic uh, liver cirrhosis. So um, you can have this classification, and this classification is enabled because of the standards of, again, RDF, RDFS, and um, L that enable this classification. Then over and above the information I provided up to now, you can add arbitrary annotations to um, ontology terms to enrich that term with additional information. So here's just an example of some of the information that can be provided. So in this case, what they thought for this um, specific ontology in this specific term, you can have the information on who created this term, but you can also have um, 
what is the identifiers that's used in different systems? So for instance, the Mondo ontology refers to this as liver disorder, and this is a link that will actually open the um, correct instance of the correct concept in Mondo as well. Or you can, um, there's SNOMIT, so you may also want to know what this um, is in SNOMIT, um, which is a disease ontology, and you can find um, the corresponding concept in that ontology as well. Um, so we've spoken about this classification where you go from the most um, general to the most specific. But what you can also do is you can say, um, provide relationships between concepts as well. So in this case here on the right hand side, what they're doing is they say, well, we have liver disease, but it has a disease location that is in the liver or a part of the liver. In that way, you can also sort of give um, sideways relations. It's not just um, this uh, parent-child relation, but also relations between arbitrary concepts. Um, then what makes all this feasible is that XML, JSON, um, RDF, RDFSL, these are all W3C standards. Um, so the screenshots that I've shown here throughout this um, is all from our ontology lookup service. And it's because these are um, standards that we are able to create tools that review these ontologies. So in the ontology lookup service, we have about 240 different ontologies coming from the um, biological domain. Um, and we can read the on these ontologies and um, show them to people because of the standards. Um, then what is also built in as part of the standards is it allows you to potentially provide different language support. So um, the ontology that I've showed you just now was um, all specified in English. But there's nothing stopping you from providing different language tags for your ontology. So in this example, this is from the um, HPI ontology. So there's the name of the ontology. Um, and for this blood group, it provides the Turkish um, translation as well. And how we've in the ontology lookup service built this is that um, often what happens is people build the ontology in English and then slowly start translating it to different languages. Um, so often not all the terms may be available in um, the, like um, not if all the terms may be available in Turkish. And in that case, we default to English, but there's nothing stopping it from, for example, um, uh, defaulting to Chinese if uh, that is the uh, language that you prefer. Then um, we've spoken, when I started talking about this, I said, well, we've got some data problems and ontologies can help to solve these problems. So now I will try and show you how ontology could potentially help. So with this issue where we have um, the numerous ways in which people refer to um, the concept female, what we can have is we can introduce a single concept for representing that. And that is something that comes from the um, Pato ontology. It's one of the ontologies on the ontology lookup service. And it has this term Pato um, 0003383. -00 and you can now, instead of having these different strings of text that you annotate your data with, you will annotate your data with this term. And it will unambiguously show you um, or link the data to this um, term. Then on the right hand side, where we had the situation where you have different um, concepts um, with the same name, what you'll do in this situation is you introduce three different terms um, with three different globally unique identifiers. And these probably will reside in three different um, ontologies. So in the fly ontology, this, um, this FB, C 00004642, which is used to refer to um, the tibia of a fly. There's and the Uberon ontology, which um, lists uh, anatomy for humans. 
um, or it has all the concepts for the anatomy of uh, humans, uh, it has tibia defined there with a different globally unique identifier. And for tibia um, as a snail, I actually couldn't find any ontology term at this stage or ontology that deals with that um, as yet. So what does it mean? Well, it might just not have, uh, it's possible that it has not been created as yet, but um, I might have also just missed it. Um, yeah. So as a, a concrete example of how ontologies can help, this um, that I'm showing here is um, the genome-wide association studies um, uh, website that is hosted by Embel EBI. And that's where they um, uh, list the genomic variants that are statistically associated with different um, with risk for disease. So here you'll see we have liver disease and we have a short form for this um, globally unique identifier. Um, and this has all the associations with that's associated with this term. It has all the studies that's associated with this term. But over and above, if you look here on the right hand side, it also has the link to open targets. Now, open targets is a database where they um, have all the information um, and they pull a lot of information together across numerous databases to um, uh, target as targets for drug research and to um, determine uh, research that will help um, with drug with the drug development for various di disease situations. Um, and this is possible mainly because we can draw this um, thread across the various databases all linked via this term because in this, across all these databases, we are going to know whenever we see this term that it refers to liver disease. And that is where the value comes um, by allowing you to pull all this information together. Then when you start using ontologies um, and vocabularies, one of the questions that will potentially come up is whether you want to make use of reasoning and um, how formal your ontology should be. Now, the um, vocabularies and ontologies can range from um, sort of informal, semi-formal to extremely formal. And the formality of the ontology will make a difference in whether you can um, apply artificial intelligence reasoning procedures on that ontology. So the most formal ontologies, you can actually apply the most sophisticated algorithms on it. Um, and the, um, it will allow you to make inferences from your ontology. So based on the axioms that you've stated in your ontology, it can make um, some inferences. And um, it could also potentially tell you if you have logical errors in your ontology. And also when you have an inference, it can allow you to um, uh, get an explanation for that inference. Uh, so that's the value of the reasoning. So typically on the less um, formal side, the semi-formal side is SCOS. On the most formal side is um, L2. In general, I would say, give preference to using L2 if you can. And the main reason for that is because of this um, ability that uh, you can have additional inferences and the error and the finding of logical errors. Um, but what I also would advise is to maybe keep it as simple as you can, because the, um, the challenge that you may sit with is even when the ontology gives you an explanation based on the reasoning procedures, these explanations at times can be very difficult to follow, even for someone that's very well versed in the underlying mathematics. So keeping it as simple as possible will give you um, the most flexibility. So do it in um, L2 if you can, keep it reasonably simple, and that should give you the most flexibility for where you want to go with your ontology. Then just to give a brief example for reasoning, and this is a very abstract example, but bear with me. So let's assume you have arbitrary entities. We have an entity A to D, and we have some characteristic we're interested in. 
and we have um, one, two, and three is the three characteristics. Then in um, step three here, what we can do is we could say um, for entity A, that entity A has this characteristic, but it has characteristic one. Entity B, let's say it has characteristic one and two. Entity C, we say it has characteristic one, two, and three. And in the case of entity B, we say, okay, it's only got characteristic two. Um, if we, uh, if you look here on the left-hand side, you would see this is quite a flat list, particularly for these entities. That's all I am interested in for this um, example at the moment. Um, and if we run a reasoner now on this, based on these axioms, it will infer these um, hierarchy automatically. Um, based on the reasoning. And that is used extensively in the biological um, community, in the ontologies that we have in the biological community. Then lastly, this is my last slide, then um, when you want to build your own ontology, or, or should you be building your own ontology or should you reuse? Now, in general, the guidance here is try and reuse as far as possible. Um, it's always better to use an existing ontology if you can, if it, um, particularly if it adheres to your um, requirements. Then um, what you also want to look at, or what happens sometimes if there's multiple ontologies that may serve um, a certain domain, then in that regard, what you want to do is you want to give preference to the ontology that is kept up to date with the domain um, that you're interested in. So if your domain is very fast moving, you want to have frequent updates on your ontology. But if your domain is not that frequently changing, then having maybe once in a year, once in five year updates is completely um, uh, reasonable for such an ontology. Um, then when you uh, find the ontology, that doesn't really serve your needs 100%, or let's say it serves your needs mostly, but there's some concepts that are missing. What you want to do in that case is try and reach out to the community in um, question there, um, either by opening an issue on their issue tracker or by actually reaching out to them directly, contacting them directly. Um, and try and see whether you can add the concepts that you desire to that ontology. And only if you've done all these checks sort of and found that there's really no ontology that serves um, your needs, you should go and consider creating your own ontology. Um, I think in terms of um, ontologies, the one thing to think of is that um, uh, the main value proposition for any ontology is that it is used and reused and extended um, as part of a community. And that is what also um, supports the FAIR principles, where the FAIR principles is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, then um, having a less than perfect ontology is probably more um, desirable than having a perfect ontology that only you using and no one else is using it. So um, sometimes with these ontologies, you have to make some compromises. Um, at, at times potentially make less than um, optimal choices, but as long as there's a huge um, or a reasonable community using that ontology, you will find the benefit in terms of the integrated but um, the findability, um, the fair principles uh, for your ontology. And that I think it's all from me. Yes, that's it.